I'm Philip Thornton, and I'd like to welcome you to the teaching ministry of Legacy Faith Church. With ears to hear and eyes to see, it's now time for you to feed your faith and starve your doubts to death. Now let's get into the Word together. Amen. And uh, excited to be in this series. We have been uh, discussing knowing and understanding the names of God. And from more than just knowing a name, but to knowing his name. There's a huge difference in knowing a name from the standpoint that you may, you may know that my name is Philip. Philip. But if you don't know what my name represents and you don't know the character of the individual who's carrying the name, then you might merely have a head knowledge of what to call me. But it does not, know, it does not mean you know what to expect from me. And this is how many people's lives are reflected when they live as quote-unquote Christians. They know to call the Lord Jesus but they really don't know what that means when they're calling on his name. They don't really understand everything that the name embodies, okay? And so as we come into this study that we've been in, we are finding and recognizing that there are specific and significant graces, power, enabling abilities of God that's made available to each of us because we know his name. Now, I understand, and many of you are going to say, yes, pastor, and I believe that in Jesus, all of the names of God are embodied. And if that's your belief, that is correct. But if you understand that principle, then there's also an understanding that as a believer, you have to learn how to believe God for specific promises. For instance, if you are in need of a creative miracle, glory to God. That's wonderful. God knows your need. But if the only name that you know God by is that he's a provider and you don't know him as a healer, then you can abound in provision but never have the manifestation of that which you need. Now again, I understand that the name Jesus embodies all of the covenants that God has made available unto us. So what we have to recognize is, is that the kingdom of God invading our lives will invade our lives through the knowledge of God's will. And until you know or have knowledge of his will, then you really have no root or anchor to exercise your faith. We teach this, we've taught it for many years now, that really the activity of a human being is to learn how to use their faith on purpose. As the purpose of God unfolds, as your destiny is unfolding in the earth, you have a very real enemy who is doing everything he can to cause there to be hindrances to your destiny. He's doing everything he can to throw up roadblocks and obstacles to your destiny. He's doing everything he can to slow you down or even stop you in your tracks. Those of you who know us here at Legacy and you know me and you've been with us for the last several years, right? Probably one of the greatest recent testimonies of this application in my own life was in April of 2016 when doctors found a tumor in my neck and diagnosed me with stage four head and neck cancer and said, you'll be lucky to be alive in a year from now and you'll, you'll be lucky if you ever speak again. The enemy threw up a roadblock, an obstacle. Well, what did I do? What should we do? Well, thank God that I knew his name. Because the first response out of my spirit was, oh, no, devil. Uh-uh. I already know him as a healer. 
I've already seen miracle after miracle. I've already seen healing after healing. I've already experienced, I've prayed for people and watched tumors dissolve in front of my eyes. I have watched people supernaturally get healed from bone diseases and heart diseases and kidney diseases. I've watched God move. So devil, you can throw your best shot. You can try to stop me if you want to. You can throw up this roadblock, but I'm here to tell you, I know his name. And in the name of Jesus is the provision of supernatural healing. In the name of Jesus, God established. He revealed it in covenant as the Lord that heals me. Praise the Lord. And so part of the application then begins to be is, do you know him as the God who will heal another or do you know him as your healer? Right? And I look around the room and I know that there are people in this room that know him as their healer. Where the doctor said it's impossible, we don't give you a whole lot of hope, you're going to go through hell, you're going to go through. And listen, I'm not against doctors. I want you to understand that. I'm not against medical practitioners. I'm not, I don't condemn people for using medicine because the Bible teaches all power comes from God. That doctor had to get revelation and understanding in some way at some time on how to administer what they did. But there's still a God in heaven that's even greater than the greatest physician that's in the earth. His name is Jesus. He's still a healer. He's still a deliverer and he'll still work supernaturally in the life of those who believe. So I make that clear because I recognize we're all in this thing together and on our journey of faith, but what God is wanting for each of us is to grow and develop so that our faith becomes highly developed in the technology, if you will, of God's kingdom. Hosea chapter 4, a very familiar passage of scripture to a lot of believers, says these words. My people perish because of a lack of knowledge. But then he goes on to say, and because you've rejected knowledge, I'll also reject you. So the reality or the truth is, is that for every one of us, We have to take a minute and say, all right, God, I am opening up my heart, my mind, my will to the knowledge of God. I am am right now, regardless of my past experience, regardless of any disappointments, regardless of any things that did not work in my favor, I as a human being am going to position myself and submit myself to the knowledge of God and the knowledge of God's word. This is the beginning ground, the foundational place for every one of us. And that's what's so wonderful about it. God doesn't care where you came from doesn't care what you've been through. All he's looking for you is to stop and open up your heart, open up your spirit, open up your mind, not reject the knowledge that he's given and recognize that it's through the knowledge of his word, the knowledge of his will, that he will begin to show you and reveal to you the promises that you can access by faith. The Bible tells us in Ephesians, right, that it's through the covenants of promise that we become divine or we become partakers of his divine nature. And so again, as we walk through this series together, one of the things that God is wanting us to to grow in, to develop in, is the knowledge of his will, the knowledge of his word. And through knowledge, right, you're able to now use your faith on purpose. Legacy Faith Church, I'm going to ask you one question and one question only at this particular moment. Where does faith begin? Where the will of God is known. Now, you're, you're light years ahead of others who do not understand that basic principle, truth. True biblical faith only begins where the will of God is known. But bless God, when you begin to understand the will of God and know God's will, this is where now, as a human being, as an individual, as a man or a woman in the earth, God begins to bring you into a position where as a son 
or a daughter of God, the provisions, the things that God has designed for you to walk in now are accessible to you and will begin to unfold in your life. Did you go to Exodus chapter 3? Praise the Lord. Let's go here real quick, and I'm going to pass in review, and we're going to get into two more of the names of God today. And, um, and I, 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 I have an intention to try to wrap up this series on the names of God over at least by the end of July um, so that we can begin to move into something else. But I believe that God, literally, God is wanting us to understand and know all the things that he has provided for us. Exodus chapter 3. And we are familiar with the opening uh, verses here. I've talked about it where uh, in verse 6, God says to uh, um, Moses, I am the God of your father, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob. Moses hid his face for he was afraid to look upon God. And the Lord said unto him, um, am I in the right place? Yeah, praise the Lord that I have surely seen the affliction of my people which are in Egypt. I have heard their cry by the reason of their taskmasters, for I know their sorrows. I have come to deliver them out of the hand of the Egyptians, to bring them up out of that land into a good land, unto a land that flows with milk and honey, unto the place of the Canaanites, the Hittites, the Amorites, the Perizzites, Hivites, and Jebusites. He goes on to say, Now therefore, behold, the cry of the children of Israel has come unto me, and I have also seen the oppression wherewith the Egyptians have oppressed them. Come now, therefore, and I will send unto you Pharaoh, that you might bring forth my people, the children of Israel, out of Egypt. Moses says unto God, Who am I? Who am I that I should go unto Pharaoh? and that I should bring forth the children of Israel out of Egypt. He said, certainly, God said, certainly, I will be with you, and this shall be a token unto you that I have sent you when you have brought forth the people out of Egypt, and you will serve God even upon this mountain. And Moses asks this question. Moses says unto God, behold, behold, when I come in, Come unto the children of Israel, and I say unto them, The God of your fathers has sent me unto you. And they shall say unto me, What is his name? What shall I say unto them? Now the reason that I brought this one to the forefront today is is that even Moses who's having a face-to-face encounter with God, burning bush experience, comes into a place where God says, okay, now I'm raising you up and I'm going to send you back down. Understand that Moses was an Israelite. We understand this. We recognize he was born uh, an Israelite, but he was raised in Pharaoh's house. God begins to, to work in the life of Moses, but Moses does not yet really know God. He knows about God, like so many people in the earth today, so many people in America, so many people that ascribe themselves to nominal Christian lives that, yes, I believe in God. Moses knew about God. He knew his heritage. He knew his foundations, but he did not yet have that personal encounter one on one with God. So God comes to Moses and says, Moses, I'm going to send you back down there and you're going to go talk to Pharaoh face to face and you're going to deliver my people. And so Moses does something that's very important. Okay, God, who are you? And when they ask me, who sent you? Who do I tell them? What is your name? What is the power that's backing my decree. Who is the God that's standing behind me? When I stand on the platform, who is God? Yes, he's in front of me, but he's also behind me. His name is supporting me. His name is undergirding me. So who shall I tell them sent me? And when they ask what is his name, I'm asking you, God, what? is your 
name. And so God begins to say, he said, go and tell them that I am that I am has sent you. Now, what this is, the word I am that I am is the place where God begins to reveal himself or as his name reveals, he is the self-existent almighty God. That's what I am that I am. It literally in the Hebrew means I am, I am, I am, and I am. I am, I was, I am, I will be, I am, I forever will be. There is no time that I do not exist. That's exactly what he's saying. It's the same word that's reflected to us in Hebrews chapter 13, verse 8. Jesus, the same, yesterday I am, today I am, and forever will be, I am. He's the one that says in the scriptures that he is the Lord our God who changes not. So when God tells Moses to tell them, I am sent you. He's saying, listen, this is the self-existent, almighty, the creator. There is no other God. There's none like him. Nobody created him. There's none before him. There'll never be any after him. And so this is my name. I am. Glory to God. And so the self-existent, the almighty God. And so this is what now comes forward in Exodus chapter 6, when Moses now comes down into Egypt to begin the process of delivering the people, and God now says to Moses, by my name, the Almighty God, they have known me, but my, by my, my name, Jehovah or Yahweh, they've not yet known me. Now, I've talked about this. We've been in this for several weeks in how God begins to reveal himself throughout the old covenant through covenants of promise. And every time man or men, specifically the men of faith that are given to us in the Old Testament, had an encounter with God, a face-to-face -face encounter with God, they would come up with an understanding of this God who is the I am will manifest himself as a healer. He will manifest himself as a provider. He will manifest himself as the one who will give you the assurance of victory, peace, right? So everywhere that God manifested himself, they would build an altar and give a name, a covenant name to God, a compound name that he is Jehovah or Yahweh, and then they would put a descriptor to that provider, healer, Peace, shepherd, shepherd, I shall not want. Well, look at this for just a minute. Because again, I, I, I want to make this very clear. This is one of those covenant names of God. He is Yahweh Rohi. He is my shepherd. He is the Lord who leads me, who guides me, who strengthens me, who equips me. He is the God who directs and orders my steps. A good place for many of you to start would begin to make a confession similar to that. Some of you believe in God, but you've really, 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 really never submitted yourself to the leadership of the Holy Spirit. And it would do you well, and God will do you well if you will begin this journey by saying, Lord, you're my shepherd. Father, thank you that you order my steps. You're directing me, that I'm looking unto you, not only as the author and finisher of my faith, but Father, I'm looking to you to direct me, to bring me into the place of protection. So number one, as your shepherd, I will never want nothing that I ever need. He'll cause me to want for. That's a powerful statement. I'll never want. I'll never come behind. I'll never lack. It doesn't matter what the economies are doing. It doesn't matter what the world is doing. It doesn't matter what those things are around you are doing. When God is your shepherd, he already knows the paths and the ways to bring you into perfect provision, perfect anointing, perfect protection. So he goes on to say, the Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. He does what? Verse 2. He makes me to lie down in green pastures and leads me beside still waters. So now you begin to find a description of what and who God is in his covenant name as a shepherd. He's going to make me 
to lie down. In other words, again, wherever I go, it's going to be. I'm, I'm, not, I'm not sitting in a, in a field full of weeds. I'm in green pastures. I'm in the place where the nourishment, the things that I need. Now, one of um, uh, the, 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 the wonderful principles that's available in the Word of God is Jeremiah 3 and 15 says that God will give you pastors, pastors, which is a under-shepherd that will feed you both with wisdom and with knowledge, okay? Now, I'm not exalting myself, but I want you to understand one of the magnificent things about Almighty God is, is not only does he lead us and guide us, but he brings us into green pastures. People in this room today, many people uh, I know of that became very disheartened and disillusioned with the lack of nourishment that was coming into their lives to live a life before God as an overcomer because, frankly, they were not in a green pasture. They were in a place that was filled with all kinds of pablum, baby food, and, and weeds, and it was confusing them, and they became disillusioned and disheartened. But God will lead you, make you lie down in green pastures, and make you, lead you beside still waters, the place where you can get refreshed and stay refreshed. Now, I'm not going to go through the entire psalm this morning, but I want you to understand uh, as we, we will read a few more verses here, but the fact is, is, is that this is one of those covenant names. And for any one of us, the Bible tells us, if we need wisdom, if we need knowledge, if we need understanding, we're to just ask God and he'll give it generously. So as a believer, you have a right by covenant to say, Father, in the name of Jesus, you are my shepherd. Right now, I need wisdom. Right now, I need refreshing. Right now, I need nourishment for my soul. Right now, Lord, thank you that you are instructing me. And watch what God will begin to do. Again, using your faith on purpose. Legacy Faith Church, one thing that we recognize and we have to always remember, what does the scripture say about faith? The word is near you. It's in your mouth and it's in your heart, the word that you speak. So many people have to move into the place where they are not trusting in, or when I say not trusting, that they do not leave things to chance, but they're beginning to activate their and actively use their faith. Open your mouth wide. Psalms 81.10 says if you open your mouth wide, God will fill it. And so as a believer, one of the things that you're going to not be required to do, you get to do. And please understand again those words as well. There's nothing in the kingdom of God that God makes you do. You get to do it. Because you choose to, because you will to, God begins to open unto you an avenue whereby you can access this particular grace. So remember, knowing his name gives you access to God's power and his grace for a specific result. So if you need the leadership of the Holy Ghost in your life, then start talking to him about it. Praise the Lord. Lord, thank you for leading me. Thank you for guiding me. Thank you for instructing me. You lead me beside still waters. You lead me in green pastures. Next verse, he says, he restores my soul. He restores my soul and leads me in paths of righteousness for his name's sake. Father, thank you that today my mind is renewed, restoring of the soul. Thank you that today, Lord, the, the, the regrets, the fears, the disappointments, the unforgiveness, the bitterness, the things that have happened in my life that have afflicted my soul, that have caused me to live in my life with great question and with great distrust to men and to you, God, thank you that right now you restore my soul. Right now, my mind, my will, and my emotions are not bound by the disappointment of my childhood. My mind, my will, and my emotions are not afflicted by the trauma that I experienced 
as a X, Y, or Z, whatever it was, because it doesn't matter. All of our stories are different. Your story is yours, but God who is your shepherd restores your soul. He brings you into a place where instead of you living your life, looking into your past and reliving the traumas and reliving the pain and living in a place of great distrust, you're able to literally turn your back to that and turn your face to God. And when you do that, God begins to bring you into a place where his will, his plans, and his purposes are for you. Hope is born again in the heart, and now you can trust that God is for you and not against you. People, this is the restoration of your soul. Thank God for it. Thank God through the covenant name that he is Jehovah Rohi, that that is the promise I can embrace in my life that my soul is restored and God is leading me in paths of righteousness for his name's sake. Keep going. Next verse. We'll read a couple more. Though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will not fear. I will not fear. You're with me. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. He is Jehovah Rohi. He's your shepherd, right? He is going to bring you into a place of protection. He will give you his rod to instruct you, to discipline you. Please don't be afraid of the word discipline. The word discipline is no different than the word instruction. He will instruct you in the way in which you shall go. He will enlighten your path so that you do not find yourself snared by a trap of your enemy. He is a God whose rod is given to you in your life so that you do not walk in places that are going to cause you harm. And then his staff, they comfort you. So God will discipline you, but then he also pulls you to himself. I thank God for this. I do. I really do. You know, um, I, I talk about myself a lot from the standpoint, not in boasting in myself, but my experiences where, you know, as we go through life and the warfare is real, I, I, I'm not ashamed. I'm not ashamed of the fact that I've had battles. I'm not ashamed of the fact that I went through the time where I had to overcome that disease that came upon my life. I'm not ashamed of the fact that there have been times in my life where because I was not fully following the Lord who is my shepherd, that um, like a sheep who goes astray, and I know none of you have ever gone astray. Praise the Lord. Thank God that you're all good, obedient, wonderful, nice sheep, and nothing has ever, ever, ever happened to any of you, right? But I have, and I found myself being chased by wolves before. I found myself, if you will, almost being devoured and destroyed, even though I was a believer in Jesus, right? Why? Because I wasn't following the leadership of the Holy Spirit. It's very simple for all of us, but the fact of the matter is, is now I know that his staff comforts me, that there were those times in my life when, as King David said, when my foot almost slipped, when I, when I almost lost it, when it was, I mean, when I knew that it was the end of the road for me, God, you drew me back. It's because of your hesed, your loving kindness, your mercies that's new every day, that God, you have drawn me back unto yourself. You are with me, your rod and your staff, they comfort me. Glory to God. Glory to God. So this is, this is what it means to understand and know his name as Jehovah Rohi. See, it's, it's not that you can just say, yes, I'm on, the Lord is my shepherd. Hallelujah. No. Can you say, Lord, you're my shepherd. You're leading me. You're guiding me. The Bible says he'll lead you and guide you into all truth. He'll show you things to come. And so this is part of the application of what God is wanting us to understand and recognize that as a God of covenant, he wants you to understand this is who he, he is if you will allow him to be in your life, right? Um, I, I look around the room and I see all my, all my beautiful faces, people that I love and, and I recognize, Right? None of you in this room are stubborn. I've never heard 
right? In talking to individuals, talking about their spouse or even about themselves, well, sometimes I'm just stubborn. None of you have ever said that, right? None, none of you have ever had that kind of situation where you said, yeah, that, that's my husband or my wife, and they're just stubborn, right? Well, see, stubbornness is many times that thing that rises up in us when we want to do what we want to, even though God is leading us in a different direction. Praise the Lord. The Lord is my shepherd. I shall not want. He delivers me from evil. Glory to God. Praise the Lord. So this is, this is the covenant name that God has made available to you as your shepherd. One more quick name found in Jeremiah chapter 23 that I'll try to get through today. God loves, if you will, revealing himself to mankind in whom he created in his image. God takes pleasure in revealing to you his character and his nature. In Jeremiah chapter 23, we're going to find yet another compound name of God that you are able as a believer to access the grace that's provided through that name in your life. Jeremiah chapter 23, and glory to God. Might as well start in verse 5. Well, might as well start in verse 1. Well, just, just because, and, and the only reason I want to go here is because as we read this, if you cannot see how these truths are unfolding in our generation and in our time and in the earth as it exists today, he gives a woe, a warning, to the pastors that have destroyed and scattered the sheep of his pasture. Okay? Now, don't get mad at me. Right? If you have a bag of rocks, praise the Lord, tie it up tight, and if you throw the rocks, throw the whole bag at me at one time so I can dodge it. We have a gentleman. Is Keith Engel here today? Keith, are you here? No? Praise the Lord. Um, several weeks ago, um, a couple of months ago, we brought a young couple up here, members of the church, great, great couple, pursuing God, following God, doing everything they can to live their lives in obedience to God. Gave their lives to become missionaries, and so they went to Wales in, in Europe. And I remember they were going over to Wales. They actually had received a position within a mainline denominational church, the Anglican Church in Wales, and the purpose of their hire was to bring them into a place so that as a young couple they could breathe new life into, the area, into an area of the church and to help this church come into the evolution of the end-time revival and move of God. Okay? And so this young couple... Praise God, they gave their lives, they packed up their bags, they raised the money that was necessary, they moved over there, they get settled in, and then they run into a devil, a religious devil, All right? Why am I saying this? Well, they ran into pastors that have destroyed and scattered the sheep. They ran into a system over there that though they said they want the things of God, they want the things of God on their terms. Well, ladies and gentlemen, you can't have the God, things of God on your terms. You got to get them, get them on God's terms. You're not going to be able to walk out of here and twist the arm of God. You're not going to arm wrestle the Almighty and beat him at his own game. You're not going to get what you want on your own terms. God has given his word. He's not going to change his word. And so, 
they got over there, got settled in. They, they, they started doing the work, interacting, making friends, beginning the, the process of, 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 of getting their job description and their feet wet and learning the people. And then all of a sudden, it wasn't really all of a sudden, but the enemy shows up and says, and uh, by the way, um, I need you to support this transgender priest. Oh, we all mourn at this stuff. But people, this, excuse me, I want to say the C word. Oh, crap. <laughs> she didn't hear me. I'm joking. <laughs> Can I tell my joke now? No, praise the Lord. Here's the joke, right? I, I married her for her looks, just not the looks I'm getting right now. <laughs> Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. Amen. Have mercy on me, Lord. But, but the point being made, people, is we're living in a time in the earth where such wickedness has infiltrated the hearts, the minds, religious spirits, religious devils that want to present to people a form of godliness, but it's denying the power of God. And God cannot bless that stuff. And so God says, listen, even in the prophet Jeremiah, woe unto the pastors that have destroyed and scattered the sheep of my pasture. How, how devastating it's going to be to those leaders who sat there and led people in to sin and iniquity, saying that God was okay with it. I don't understand it. I, it, doesn't, it doesn't compute with my heart, my mind, or my spirit, but more importantly, it doesn't compute with the Word of God. That's the most important thing. And so it says, Therefore thus says the Lord God of Israel, against those pastors that have fed my people and scattered my flock and driven them away and have not visited them, I will visit upon you even the evil of your doings. I will gather a remnant of my flock out of all countries where I have driven them, and I'm going to bring them again to their folds, and they shall be fruitful and increase. The Lord is my shepherd. I shall be fruitful and and increase. Glory to God. I will uh, set up shepherds over them that shall feed them and they shall fear no more. I'm telling you. Fear not, ladies and gentlemen. No more. Right? Nor be dismayed. Neither shall you lack, says the Lord. For behold, the days come, says the Lord, that I will raise unto David a righteous branch, Messiah, and the king shall reign and prosper and execute judgment and justice in the earth. In his days, Judah shall be saved, Israel shall dwell safely, and this is the name. Everybody say, this is the name. This is the name. This is the name whereby he shall be called. Covenant name, number five, six in our series, Jehovah Sidkenu, the Lord my righteousness. The Lord our righteousness. But again, can you say the Lord is my shepherd? My shepherd? Can you say the Lord is my righteousness? Because the person on your left and your right cannot say that for you. It has to be your personal confession. It has to be your personal conviction. The Lord is my righteousness. This is what the Bible tells us in 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verses 17 through 21. He who knew no sin became sin for you that you might be made the righteousness of God in him. It was because God, who is not a man, became a man, gave his life in exchange for yours so that he could take your unrighteousness and give you his righteousness. This is what the covenant name, the Lord is my righteousness, is all about. It's why I can come into this place 
And regardless of my failures and my shortcomings in any event that occurred in my past, I can walk into this altar as the righteousness of God and make a decree, a heavenly decree, and have God hear and answer my prayer. Not because of my unrighteousness, but because Jesus became my righteousness for me. And I can boldly say the Lord is my righteousness. Glory to God. But if I don't know that, if I don't know that that is his name, that this is the name whereby he shall be called, I know many believers. When I say believers, I know many people that believe in Jesus have even accepted Jesus as their Lord and Savior, but live defeated lives because they don't understand. He's the Lord, my righteousness. They don't understand that. And so they, they live their lives. Well, I, I know God loves me, and, and I, know, I know he gave his life for me, but, you know, I'm just, I'm just a worm. I just, I'll never be good enough for, for God to work like that in me. You know, I, I just, I have so many wrong thoughts and bad thoughts and stuff in my life. Ladies and gentlemen, please remember the Lord your God, the Lord your righteousness. He it is who takes away your iniquities, removes your sin from you as far as the east is from the west. When he forgives you, you are forgiven. Your job is to confess your sin. His job is to forgive you and he never fails at his job. He's the Lord our righteousness. And so in knowing him and knowing his name, right, he is the Lord our provider. He is the Lord our healer. He is the Lord our banner. He is the Lord our peace. He is the Lord our shepherd. And now he's the Lord our righteousness. And all of these attributes we know are summed up in the name of Jesus. We understand that all of these are made available to us through the, the sacrifice that God gave when he gave himself, when he came to make himself the substitute for our sin, that that makes all of this available to us. But again, like we started, who shall you say he is? When Jesus asked, the disciples, in Matthew chapter 16, who do men say that I, the Son of Man, am? Some say you're Elijah. Some say you're Jeremiah or one of the prophets. And Jesus said, who do you say that I am? And of course, Peter says, thou art the anointed one, the Christ. You are the anointed one and his anointed. You are the Son of the living God. This is where now, what you say, who you say, and what you know about God is going to be highly beneficial to you in walking out and fulfilling the destiny and plan that God has for you in life. He is my provider. Is he yours? He is my shepherd. Is he yours? Right? He is my healer. Is he yours? He is my banner. Is he yours? He's my peace. Is he yours? He's my righteousness. Is he yours? And each of you need to come to the place where in knowing his name, you're boldly declaiming, proclaiming and declaring. It's more than just knowing that it's Jireh, Rapha, Rohish, Shalom, having, you know, having some Hebrew vocabulary. But no, do you know him? Do you know his name? Do you know the specific grace that's made available to you by knowing that name? Do you know that he's your provider? Do you know he's your healer? Do you know he's your righteousness? Thank you for viewing our online experience. I pray today's teaching has helped you draw closer to Jesus or inspired you with wisdom and revelation from the Word of God. If you're a new believer or would like to know more about what it is to follow Jesus, please reach out to us on the website or follow us here on social media. Also, if you'd like to contribute to making a difference to lives around the world, please select the giving button on our website. We would love to stay connected with you. Remember, faith comes by hearing and hearing by the Word of God. Here at Legacy Faith Church, we decree, this is the victory that overcomes the world, even our faith.